you to focus our attention on verses, you know, this is the last sermon of the year, and I just thank God that we are able to be as, as few as we are, even in here, even with the technical difficulties, uh, we just thank God for his grace and his mercy. Luke chapter 13, I need your prayers, verses 6 through 9, and you'll find the word of God reads on, on this wise. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. He came and sought 
fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? And he answered and said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it, and if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. Amen. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God remains the same. Before you take your seat, look at somebody lovingly, eyeball to eyeball if you can. Just look at it, I'll say it. I want to place a tag on this text. I want to talk about another year, another chance. Another year, another chance. You may be seated. God of grace and God of mercy, Lord, we bless your name right now. Uh, humbly we come, come before you, Father, asking that you would forgive us of our sins, that you would rescue me from me. Holy Spirit, it is your time. Have your way. It is our desire that you would be glorified, the saints would be edified, sinners would be evangelized. This is your servant's prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This year has brought tremendous deaths. Many people that started out with us at the beginning of 2020 have gone on to try a world unknown. My late grandfather, O.T. Moses, used to say that every year carries out its number. And as we gather, the few of us, or even virtually, we must ask ourselves, why am I still here? Why did the Lord allow me to stay when so many have gone on? And if we live to see 2021, if we live to see 2021, I want us to be mindful of these three things. Number one, God let us slide on some things that we left undone last year. Some things that we should have done that we started out to do. God let us slide. Whether it was committing to our prayer life, studying his word, enrolling in school, looking for a new job. Whether it was making amends in a relationship gone south. You know what you told God you would do. So God let us slide on some things that we've left undone, number one. Number two, God has been patient with us. And really, I can stop right there and shout all by myself because God has been patient with me. And I know I'm not the only one that can thank God for being so patient, that can thank God for being so long-suffering. His patience is a picture of his grace. Number one, God let us out of things we left undone. Number two, God's been patient with us. Number three, rest assured that God's patience does run out. So the relevant question for us as we walk around this text before we get into the, the, the whole of the sermon today is how long do we expect God to just sit back and not involve himself with the affairs of our lives? How long do we expect for him to be patient with us? How long do we expect for him to give us another year and another year and another year? That's why if we live to see 2021, we should thank God, here it is, for another year and another chance. Luke chapter 13, verse 6 and 9, it's about a story. It's about um, a certain man that has a vineyard. And in this vineyard, he has planted a fig tree. Three years, he's come back, and he's had expectations each year to come by that he might see some figs on the fig tree. Each year he's come by to expect the tree because he has expectations. This is, this is his. He planted it. He has expectations that each year he's going to see some fruit on that fig tree. Each year he has expectations, but every year his expectations are met by frustration. Because every year that he comes to examine this tree, there are no fruit, no, there are leaves, but no figs on the tree. And so this vineyard owner with great expectations is met with great frustration 
Because every year he comes back to see this fig tree. It has no figs on it. He has expectations met with frustration. So ultimately, he makes a determination. And his determination is cut it down. It's not bearing no fruit. Cut it down. But the joy of the text for me was, even though he has expectations, even though he has determination, frustration, e even though he comes to a determination, the shock in this text is the mediation. And I don't want you to miss this, because this, this owner has a right, he has expectations, his expectations are met by frustration, there's no fruit, no fig on the tree, he makes a determination to, 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 to cut the tree down, but the vineyard dresser mediates. Then he addresses steps in. He steps in and he says, Oh, you know, before he cut it down, let me do something different that I didn't do last year. He said, Let me dig around it. Let me dung around it. Dig and dung and take some of the some of the air rate and give it some air. He said, let, let me let me give it some special attention. And, and if it bears fruit, that's well. But if it doesn't bear fruit, Go here and cut it down. That's the story. But but he, here are some lessons, and I, I, I've got I've got some lessons in here. I hope God let me get through this whole sermon here. The first lesson that God teaches us is that God spares our lives to give up to give us an opportunity. Here it is to turn it around. I'm gonna say that again for somebody that missed that. God spares our lives to give us the opportunity to turn it around. This text also teaches us that time is precious. Tell somebody, time is precious. And we waste precious time doing things that really do not matter in the eternal scheme of things. God gives us time to turn it around. Time is precious, but God's mercy is also displayed in his patience. Let's walk around this text. Let's look at this tree a little bit more closely. Let's examine this tree and see if we can pull some preaching pearls out of this that's productive for living in 20 and 21. The symbolism of the tree, first of all, the, the tree is unproductive. The parable centers around an unproductive tree that bears no fig. Now, in this Middle Eastern climate, these trees usually bore fruit around, around around June. March, April, leaves start to show, and around June, there was some fruit. But, but this tree was unproductive. Jesus was symbolically talking about the children of Israel, those whom he delivered from the flesh pots of Egypt, those who he had been with, those who he had cared for, those who he had taken care of, and they had forgotten who God was. They did not glorify him by demonstrating fruitfulness or righteousness. But it also represents, here it is, those of us who call ourselves Christians, who are saved, but do not live lives to production, to reflect productivity towards the kingdom. Preach for I'm doing the best I can. This symbolism of the tree represents unpro unpro uh, unproductive. It's an unproductive tree. But then also this symbol represents that this tree is misleading. Fig trees are known for the large green leaves. As I said, around Jerusalem, they appeared in March and April. But the fruit does not appear sometime in June. This tree had leaves. It had leaves, but no fruit. When it was time for the fruit to be developed, it had leaves, but no fruit. Something had retarded the growth of the tree to produce fruit when it was time to produce fruit. And really this is analogous to Christians who appear holy but bear no fruit. Something has gone wrong in the field. They come to church but that's about it. No fruit. This tree is unproductive. This tree is misleading. This tree is obstructive. Unfruitful trees, listen, soak up nutrients from Mother Earth from the productive trees that are planted around. They obstruct production. How? Glad you asked. 
the unproductive, unproductive leaves make the productive trees process much more harder and strenuous. One of the most challenging persons in the world is someone who will not do anything productive to grow, but wants to stay in the way of someone who can grow and make the difference. This tree is obstructing. I'm going to take my time. I just really need your prayers. Because I want you to see the dynamic tension in this text. I want you to see the dynamic tension in this text. The inspector is not pleased. Watch the movements in the text. The owner of the vineyard has a problem. He has a problem. The tree that bears no fruit. No doubt the owner has expectations. He has expectations. No doubt the owner comes for three years. He's looking for fruit, but he sees no fruit. He has expectations. And the preaching hermeneutic in this text is God has planted us on earth, and he expects some fruit out of all of our life. God has expectations. This owner has expectations. God has expectations. The owner has frustrations. The owner of the vineyard became frustrated. He came, How would you handle life when you know that you have expectations that don't produce? Can you blame the owner of the vineyard? He did not plant tomatoes. He did not plant apples. He did not plant oranges. He planted figs. And he had expectations that that tree would produce figs. But when he came to see the figs, there was no fruit on the back. He's upset, but you can't blame him. Have you ever been there? Yeah. When you had expectations that were not met? Yes, Some parent has invested in the child and they still turn out unproductive. Some man or woman have put all they had into a career, a relationship, a business venture that produced nothing. The preaching hermeneutic here is God gets fed up with unproductive lives. The owner is, has expectations, he has frustrations. Now he has the right to termination. When the owner did not see what he expected, he made the decision to terminate the tree. He was within his right to terminate the tree. The tree gave not even bare minimum, but was miserably bare. I'm going to say that again. The tree gave not even bare minimum but was miserably bad. So the owner made a decision to terminate the wastefulness of the tree. It was taking up space for a tree that could produce what he expected. This is the chilling lesson to today in the church, but, but here is the preaching harmony that God is, has a right not to allow us to live when our lives are unproductive. And let's be clear as to what God is looking for. You ought to wake up and write this down. Because bearing fruit for the kingdom means this, that, that root reproducing what reflects righteousness. Bearing fruit for the kingdom means that you're reproducing what reflects righteousness. Bearing fruit for the kingdom means you're reproducing what I'm going to say it one more time. Bearing fruit means that you're reproducing what reflects righteousness. It means that your determination and passion in life is so centered around God's purpose that other people have been drawn to Christ based on your lifestyle. I said something. That there's something divine, charismatic, spiritual about your life that represents the God that you, that you serve, that other people are drawn to Christ by your lifestyle. What kind of effect do you have on other people? Because if we're honest, if we're honest, we, we understand that God has a right to terminate our lives because we've done nothing with it for him. But here is the shout in the text. Thank God for the gardener's mediation. When the owner made a decision for determination, the gardener steps in for mediation. He said, Lord, let it alone. This year also. Let me dig about it. Let me dung about it. And if it bear fruit well, and if not, then after that, just go and cut the thing down. And in essence, he said, Lord, give this tree another year. 
another chance. This message this morning is about how Jesus mediates on our behalf. And that's why I get happy about my doggone self right there because God has been patient with me. I know he's been patient with you. But thank God we have a mediator that steps in right on time. It's the gospel story in miniature here. By right, God said we all should die of sin. And I'm preaching to folk in here like me. All of us got some ring around the collar. All of us got some baggage in here. All of us got something we don't want nobody else to know about. But thank God, God didn't terminate us, but he steps in with grace and mercy. I need somebody don't mind waving your hand and say, Lord, you brought me all the way through 2020 knowing that I didn't deserve your grace and mercy. But simply because you've been good all the time, I thank you. I thank you. On Calvary, Jesus became the gardener. I like that. On Calvary, Jesus became the gardener who stepped in and spared our lives. He, he keeps on sparing our lives out of all that has happened in 2020. God help me. And all of the people that have died, it could have been me. It could have been you. It could have been us. But it was not. God spared us another year. The question that I want to ask you this morning is what are you still doing here? Amen. I'm preaching this because we all I live it on borrowed time. Yes. What I mean by borrowed time is someone who is living that should be dead. Don't think your goodness has kept you alive. Yes. Yes. A whole lot of people far better off than you and good deeds that have gone to take the long sleep in 2020. This text is about the patience of God. I don't want you to miss that. This text is about the patience of God. We, we learned something about patience of God this morning. Yes. Trying to add this thing. We're learning about the patience of God. Learning how to wait on God. We, we're learning this is a beautiful picture about the patience and mercy of Christ. You write this down. 2 Peter 3, 9 tells us the Lord is patient toward you. Not wishing for any to you to perish, but for all to come to repentance. The patience of God is his ability to sit back and wait for an unexpected outcome with experience, without experience, anxiety, or tension. The patience of God is his ability to let go of the need for immediate gratification and be willing to wait. The patience of God is the divine attribute of God that reveals his divine tolerance, his divine compassion, his divine understanding, his divine acceptance towards those who are slower living an unpredictable life. Come here, because I'm preaching to somebody. We've been slow to the gun. We've been unproductive. But thank God that we serve a God that's been patient. You're not getting this. We serve a God that's been patient. I need somebody to say, Lord, I thank you for being patient. Here it is. Bessie, you help me preach this this morning. Well, this week, watching Netflix, Ma Rainey's Black Bob, the center of the 1920s. What got me in the movie, and I don't want to be an alert spoiler. I'm not going to tell the whole thing, but I got to share this. What got me in the movie is the late actor Chadwick Boseman. He plays a character by the name of Levin in the movie that at the end of the movie he blasphemes God yes, he, does. he curses God yeah. I, I, I'm on my seat cringing waiting for God right. to strike him down yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my mama didn't like that movie I, I, I thought it was going to have a different outcome and, but, but it, it, I, I was waiting for God to do something yeah. I didn't like the way it ended because I thought if I was God I, I would have turned that, that action set into a lightning factory and just burnt everything. But then I was reminded, I was reminded after I read it, an article by the late Robert Ingersoll. He was an American atheist, American agnostic. And after delivering one of his addresses, he pulled his watch from his pocket and said, according to the Bible, God has struck men to death for blasphemy. And he said, I'm, I'm going to blaspheme him and give him five minutes to strike me dead. Strike me dead and then damn my soul. There was a period of perfect silence. Everybody was sitting on their edge. Two minutes passed. People began to get nervous. Three minutes passed. A woman fainted. Four minutes passed. And five minutes passed. He snapped shut his watch, put his pocket in his watch, said, You see, there's no God. Or he would have taken me at my word. 
I, I thought of my myself, I thought to myself right there in that moment where it reflected on Chadwick Bozeman and that man right there. I said, thank God that I'm not God. Thank you. Because if I were God, I would be a lightning bolt factory on every corner. And then I realized that sometimes we've got to understand that God has been patient with people. God, God does not exhaust his patience in five minutes. God does not exhaust his patience on one season of foolishness in your life. God gives us time to get our act together. Sometimes God lets it look like that we, that he's not acting. But thank God that we're not God. Because if we were God, we would not have patience with people. We would have struck Chadwick down. We would have struck this author down. But thank God that God does not treat us like we want to treat everybody else. I'm standing here this morning preaching not because folk have been patient with me. I'm standing preaching because God has been patient with me. I need somebody that can recognize we serve a patient God. Give your own self a high five and say, Lord, I know I've messed up. You've been wet. I know I said I wouldn't do it no more. The same thing I said I wouldn't do in 2018. I said the same thing in 2020. But you've been patient with me. And because you've been patient with me, I can't help but to give you the praise. God, Ooh. he's patient. God's patience does run out. Romans 2, 3, 4. Do you suppose that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience? God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. And that's what I stopped by to tell you this morning on my way to heaven. Because heaven is my goal. God gives us time to turn it around. But his patience Amen. does run out. This farmer, this farmer, he comes to the, the owner of his, the, the man that owns the, the banker, and he says to the banker, he says, I've got some good news, and I've got some bad news. He said, which one do you want first? He says, give me, give me the bad news first. And let's start with the bad news. He says, okay, I've had a bad year. I can't pay the mortgage on the house I owe. Bank was pretty disgruntled. The farmer said, well, I got some more bad news. I've had such a bad year that I can't repay any of the money I borrowed on my new machines either. He said, wait a minute, I'm not finished. I got some more bad news. He said, he said, he said, I can't pay the money. I can't pay for the machinery. And he added, uh, the money that you gave me to, to borrow seeds, I lost that money. I don't got no seeds or no fertilizer. He said, you've given me all that bad news. He said, give me the good news. He said, what's the good news? He said, the good news is I still intend to do business with you. <laughs> now, you might not get that, but that's how God is. In spite of all of the stuff you messed up, aren't you glad that God still wants to do business with you? Aren't you glad that God still takes the time to fool with you? I'm glad that he still takes time and wants to do business with you. Here's the question. I'm, I'm in my seat. I want you to walk away with these four things, four organic things. I think that'll help us get into the next year, 2021, so we would be more productive with our lives. Four things. Wake up and write this down. Tweet it. Put it on Facebook, record it, however you want to get it out. How do I make the best of the time I have to bear fruit? Number one, you got to check your memory. Tell somebody to check your memory. As you go down memory lane, remember all the things you committed to and promised God at the beginning of 2020. God, God had expectations uh, that he would do what, that expectation that we would do what we said we would do. Remember that God has been good to us in our comprehensive reflection. Remember the patience of God. Remember the, prop, the provisions of God. God gives us what we need to do better. Remember the, pre the prerequisites of God. God requires for us to grow and be faithful. Number one, you've got to check your memory, but number two, you've got to correct your methods. You've got to correct the church. Say amen. You've got to correct your methods. One must cultivate the landscape of his or her own life. Aerate and excavate 
which hinders growth in your own life. That's what the gardener said he would do. There must be an urgency to examine the soil, the soil in which your life is planted, and water the seed of purpose God has planted within your life. Preach your team, Moses. We waste valuable time and miss out on many blessings of God because we apply the wrong methods. We apply the wrong methods. Stephen Covey coming, he says, we go 100 miles an hour in the wrong direction. No matter how fast you travel, if it's in the wrong direction, you're headed down the wrong road. There comes a time in life when we must face the music that we've been applying the wrong message. Face the music. Where did you get that from? Glad you asked. Max, Max Lucado says that many years ago, a man climbed his way into the orchestra of the emperor of China. Wow. Although he couldn't play a note, couldn't play no instrument, couldn't play a note. And whenever the group practice or perform, he would hold his foot against his lips, pretending to play but not making a sound. He received a modest salary and an enjoyable, comfortable life. Then one day, the, the emperor requested a solo from every musician, one by one. He wanted to hear each musician one by one. The students got nervous. He starts shaking. He starts fluttering. Start doing a convulsion. There wasn't even enough time to learn how to play the instrument. He pretended to be sick, but the royal physician wasn't fooled. On the day of his solo performance, the imposter took up poison and killed himself. The, the explanation of his suicide led to the phrase uh, that found its way uh, into the English language. He refused to face the music. How do you handle life when God calls you out? You've got to put your hand in the hand of God. There comes a time when you realize God's been patient with you. You've got to face the music. You've got to do like Miss Minnie Haskins said in, the Bristol, in, uh, in Bristol, England in 1908. Well, she said, and I said to the man that stood at the gate of the year, that stood at the gate of the year, give me a light that I might go into the unknown. And she said, as you enter into the new year, put your hand into the hand of God. And it shall to me be safer than light and better than a known way. You can't produce fruit with your hand in the hands of the devil. You've got to put your hands in the hands of God. And I can tell somebody it's time for you to switch hands this year. Switch hands from the hands of the devil and put your hands into the hands of God. Then third of all, you got to change your mindset. I'm almost done here. Change your mindset. Change your mindset. Wrong thinking results in wrong living. It is possible for someone here today to say, I'm living right. And had it all wrong. Proverbs 4 and 12 says, There is a man, there's 14, 12, there is a way that seemeth right into a man, but the end thereof are the ways of the Einstein said that we cannot solve problems at the same level of thinking we were at when we created them. We must think like Jesus thought. We must think like Jesus thought. He was not merely focused on earth, but he was focused on eternity. Philippians 2 and 5 says, Let this man being you that's also in Christ Jesus. Isaiah 26 and 3 says, Thou will keep him in peace who keeps his mind staying on thee. Here's the bad news. Here's the bad news. This morning, chances do run out. But God gives you warning signs along the way. He gives you warning signs along the way. The text suggests that the tree's options were narrow. If the tree did not produce, it would be cut down. Either produce or perish. Opportunities ultimately begin to fade away. And that's why the preacher writes in Ecclesiastes 12 and 1, Remember now thou creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, that I shall say I have no pleasure in them. Don't say God has allowed me to get old, so I must be doing something right. He might be giving you a chance to stop doing what you're doing wrong. In John Maxwell's book, Developing the Leader Within You, I'm almost done here. It was a Middle Eastern mystic that said, I was a revolutionary when I was young, and my prayer was to God, Lord, give me the energy to change the world. As I approached middle age, I realized that my life was half gone without my changing a single soul. I changed my prayer to Lord. Give me the grace to change all of those who come into contact with me, just my family, my friends, and I'll be satisfied. But now that I'm an old man and my days are numbered, I begin to see how foolish.
foolish I have been, my one prayer now is, Lord, give me the grace to change myself. If I kept praying for this right from the start, I would not have wasted my life. Here it is. I'm done for real, for real, for real, for real. Look at somebody say, for real, for real. This is an open-ended parable. It has no conclusion. The text gives us the opportunity to create our own ending. In other words, you hold the pen to create your own ending. I need to ask you, how will you end this story? Because there is a window of opportunity. That's the good news here. There's a window of opportunity. Another year means another chance. It means another opportunity. In the days of modern harboring days, this is where we get this from. A ship had to wait for the flood tide before it could make it into port. The term for this situation in land was our port too. That, that is a ship standing over off a port. Waiting for the moment when it could ride the turn of the tide to the harbor to get the ship to where it needed to be. Yeah. The English word opportunity is derived from this original meaning. The captain and the crew were ready and waiting for that one moment for they knew that if they missed it, yeah. they would have to wait for another tide to come in, come in. Another year means we have an opportunity that will never come again. As we wait the new year in, don't want, we don't want to miss the tide to take us to where we need to be. Yeah. We have been waiting for this tide to come for 352 days and now it has come. The tide of opportunity here is yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery, but today is a gift that we call the present. Yeah. I'm done here. But I got enough to preach for another three hours, but I'm going to let you go. I just thank God that sometimes the place where we want least to be is where we most need to be. For it's in the uncomfortable places where God becomes real. It was in the uncomfortable, uncomfortableness of 2020, in the midst of COVID, in the midst of loved ones dying and infected and affected by this virus that God becomes real. Change is never comfortable, but they create the experiences that God uses to refine and reshape our lives. Yeah. Blessed are those who, may, who are made uncomfortable, for they shall be conformed to the image of Christ. Right. Jesus used this parable to reach people that were where they were. Yeah. Agriculture was a leading profession of that day, and he compared the agronomy of man to the agronomy of the kingdom. The lesson today is God wants us to spread the word that Jesus died. He died for our sins, was buried in the borrowed tomb, but early Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hand. And as we leave here this morning, just remember, in 2021, don't just talk the talk, but walk the walk. Don't just talk the talk of a Christian, but walk the walk of a Christian. And tell somebody about Jesus Christ that they might be drawn to the kingdom. Yes. That will go on your account. Yes. That's true. I'm done here. All right. But I thank God thank for his patience. Yes. And as we go into 2020, if the Lord allows us to see it, then we'll remember this message. Another year. opening, sobering, unbelievable awakening. And so, if he shook you this year like he shook me on March 11th when I had the coronavirus and I truly thought I was going to die, 
he got my attention. He got my attention. So I pray that he's got your attention out there because time is not promised to any man or woman. The doors of the church are wide open. Jesus left them that way. So if you've been challenged this year with things beyond comprehension, if you have come to an understanding that Christ is the way of peace, for in his word it said, in this world you will have tribulation. And you've had it. If you need some more, he'll give it to you. But I pray you just might not make it the next time. So please, won't you come? Won't you come? And if you do feel the need this morning to join, to make a commitment, to connect with Christ Jesus, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner and that I cannot save myself. No longer will I close the door when I hear you knocking. By faith, I gratefully receive your gift of salvation. I am ready to trust you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming to earth. I believe you are the Son of God who died on the cross for my sins and rose from the dead on the third day. Thank you for bearing my sins and giving me the gift of eternal life. I believe your words are true. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus, and be my Savior. And as it says in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. In Jesus' name. Won't you come? And tides, if you care about the word of God, if you know the world needs the word of God, please give. You can give by Givelify. You can come to the church. Support Christ's ministry so that we continue to bring the good news to a dying world. In Jesus' name. Thank you. Thank you. And amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. Let me say before we come to the conclusion of this worship experience, I certainly pray we're going to have a wonderful Christmas on this past week. And my wife and I want to personally thank Calvary for your acts of kindness. Words cannot express the symbolism of the joy and the appreciation that we have. Uh, overwhelmed by joy in the words of C.S. Lewis. Uh, we thank you for your cards. We thank you for your gifts. And we just thank you for your encouragement. More than that, we thank you for just receiving us uh, this first year here at Calvary Baptist Church. Uh, we pray that God's grace and mercy will overwhelm you, will overtake you, that his blessings will overtake you. I also want to make this announcement. Uh, I received a letter this week addressed to Calvary from our, our past emeritus, Pastor, Fran Pastor Emeritus France A. Davis, with his appreciation uh, for those that show, act, show acts of kindness for his birthday celebration on the week before last. Uh, he thanks us, and at the end of the letter, he said, thanks a million. And so I voiced the sentiment not only of the past emeritus and his wife, as well as my wife and myself, for your appreciation. The last thing I want to do before they announce the, put the announcements on the screen, or however we might uh, disseminate that information, is that you, you see me wearing a button right here, and this button is, is entitled Cutting CRC, and that's Cutting Colorectal Cancer. Dr. Rogers here in, Charles Rogers here in Utah has been adamant on doing research on black males and colorectal cancer. I've been asked, I've been asked to give 40 men from Calvary that would participate in the survey. Uh, you can take the survey at www.cuttingcrc.org. 
cuttingcrc.com. That's cuttingcrc.com. And so I'm asking that you would please take that survey today, uh, at the very least, last day before the year is over, because the deadline is December 31st, uh, 2020. Uh, I want to make good on my word, so I'm asking men of Calvary, if you're between the ages of 45 and 75 years old, uh, you live here in Utah, African American, that you would please take that survey. Don't stop there. If you have friends or acquaintances that can take the survey, please encourage them to take that survey as well. I certainly pray that God will bless you and keep you this week. And remember, another year, another chance. We're standing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to smile upon you. May the Lord lift up his countenance and give you peace. Now unto him who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that worketh through us. Be now glory in the church both now and forever, world without end. And all of those who love the Lord, Lord said amen. They said amen again. Come on, throw both hands and get back and say it like you really mean it. God bless you, God keep you. That's my prayer. Dr. King's legacy, the Utah Martin Luther King Jr. Human Rights Commission is hosting an art contest for the official state decal of the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. license plate. With an accompanying slogan of Many Voices, One Utah, the selected artwork will promote diversity, equity, and human rights. The winner of the art contest will receive an official decal and will be formally recognized in January 2021 in honor of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The contest is open to students in grades seven through 12th grade and submissions are due on or before Thursday, December 31st. Please contact mlkcommission at utah.gov for more information. The Calvary Academy for Christian Development is offering the Hope Grace Sunday School Zoom class for all high school students. The class meets every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. and all those currently in high school are invited to attend and participate. The instructors are the dynamic duo of Sister Daphne Soler and Brother Charles Henderson. They are excited to have you join. Please email your instructors for more information. Salt Lake County Health Department is now offering free COVID-19 testing at the Maverick Center, 3200 South Decker Lake Drive, Tuesdays and Thursdays, 2 to 5 p.m., Saturdays, 10 to 2 p.m. COVID testing is for people with symptoms, including cough, fever or chills, fatigue, aches, difficulty breathing, new loss of taste or smell, sore throat, congestion, nausea or vomiting, or diarrhea, or who have been in close contact with someone meaning six feet for 15 minutes or more. To decrease your wait time, you may register in advance by calling 385-468-4082. Open enrollment for the Utah Community Action HEAT Program is now open for the general public. The HEAT program provides energy assistance for eligible low-income households in Utah. Fax, mail-in, drop-off, appointment, and online applications are now available. For more information, contact your local HEAT office at 1-866-205 Four three five seven. For Salt Lake County specifically, call eight zero one three five nine two four 